This is Plant-Based Briefing, Shifting to a Better World, by Kartik Shaker at aftermeatbook.com. And I'm Marian Erickson, host of this curated content plant-based podcast, where I narrate a variety of articles on plant-based, compassionate, eco-friendly topics with permission in about 10 minutes or less every weekday. Today's article is by Kartik Shaker, Ph.D., who you might remember from episode 171, where I read his article that was published in Faunalytics entitled Technical Outrage, Innovation to Reduce Animal Use, where he outlines the technical and ethical promises of microbial fermentation in a way that's both exciting and inspiring. He's also the author of the book After Meat, The Case for an Amazing Meat-Free World. And the book explores technological reasons for moving away from animal products because they're basically awful technology, very outdated, very wasteful, and we can do much better with alternative technologies such as microbial fermentation. And all indications are that the future of food will be tastier, healthier, and cheaper, kinder, better for the environment, all these wonderful things. It's a very inspirational book, and 100% of the proceeds of After Meat are donated to animal-related charities. Kartik is a trained scientist and engineer, and he finished his B.S. in biomedical engineering from the University of North Carolina, and his Ph.D. in chemical engineering from Northwestern University, and a postdoctorate position in systems biology at ETH Zurich. He currently works on the front lines of the alternative food industry in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you can visit aftermeatbook.com to learn more. And Kartik has been on both the Hope for the Animals podcast and the Vegan Family Kitchen podcast. I'll put links to both of those in the show notes as well. So now let's get to today's plant-based briefing. Shifting to a Better World by Kartik Shaker at aftermeatbook.com Consider many of the significant problems of our era. Climate change, pandemics, food security, water security, economic wastefulness, antibiotic resistance, and unnecessary suffering. Suppose that any one person could help alleviate these issues. They may not be able to solve the problems directly, but they can perform actions that enable humanity to solve them sooner. In other words, we can measure a person's good by comparing the counterfactual, considering the world with their noble activity versus a world without it. When the impact is understood this way, I see much benefit in hardline veganism, meaning to consume no animal products and help normalize alternatives in their place. This stance does tremendous good in conjunction with the tipping point phenomena. Pioneers may save thousands if not millions of animals by acting concertedly. Simultaneously, the pioneers will help curb a climate change, promote economic growth, and induce fantastic gastronomy. We can all do so much good by practicing, at least for periods, hardline veganism. First, we must understand the problems of animal agriculture and the imperative to replace it. Seventy billion land animals are slaughtered yearly, often under heinous, gut-wrenching conditions. Animal agriculture is highly resource-intensive, capitalizing on a third of the ice-free land on planet Earth, and the biggest driver of deforestation. Suppose we replace animal agriculture with over 100 times faster microbial fermentation— In that case, we could obtain double benefits. We'd reduce emissions and free up gobs of land that we could repurpose for carbon dioxide capture. In other words, we don't need breakthroughs in transportation or energy technology to tackle climate change. We can use trees if we stop cutting them down and make space for them. Sticking with animal agriculture also increases risks for pandemics, hurts economic, food, and water security, and limits the potential of food. In the long term, our food will be tastier, more nutritious, and more affordable when we don't use limited and obsolete animal technology. The good news is that we will replace animal agriculture. Replacement will occur following a tipping point, where initial change will be slow but rapidly accelerate and slow down again as we near completeness. The initially slow, then fast, and finally slow trajectory looks like the letter S, hence the namesake S-curve. We've seen tipping points and S-curves before, such as technological tipping points of smartphones replacing landlines, or web streaming replacing brick-and-mortar rental stores. We've also experienced social tipping points and S-curve transitions. 
In 1988, 88% of Americans deplored same-sex marriage, but 30 years later, a majority have come to accept it. We've witnessed similar social S-curves with race, gender, and sexuality rights. New technologies and social changes will ultimately end animal agriculture. As argued in the book After Meat, the technical ceiling of plant and microbial-based technology is vastly higher than anything we can produce with an animal. It'll be like going from donkey carts to electric vehicles. Every facet we seek in food will be better with alternatives. Simultaneously, we'll all develop better sensibilities about veganism and anti-speciesism, just as we have militated against racism, sexism, and homophobia over time. If replacing animal agriculture is inevitable, it sounds like we should do nothing or passively let others play the role. But replacing animal agriculture is one of our time's most pressing and vital efforts. If we can replace it sooner, we all get the attendant benefits much earlier. Consider if we shift the S-curve forward by one hour, then that's 8 million land animals saved, or 70 billion divided by the hours in a year. Law professor Cass Sunstein notes how social movements occur through a snowball effect. Pioneers start the process. Those forerunners inspire others. Others follow from the second wave and so on. There are many actions we can take to accelerate the social cascade. Hosting a vegan dinner party with non-vegans. Convincing our workplace to have fully vegan meals. Organizing a conference to default to vegan options. Being unabashedly vegan and a great role model to others. And pledging to help normalize alternatives and obsolete animal products. These actions may shave microseconds on the curve shift and save tens to thousands of animals in the long run. Steadfastness is an essential ingredient for social change. Suppose I call a restaurant and ask them their vegan options, and they say, well, we can take the cheese out of the stuffed mushrooms. I then might say, okay, that's pretty meager. I'm going to another place, thanks. The restaurant gets the cue to develop more options, making it easier for others to go vegan, thereby speeding the transition. My action also creates market pressure for the continued development of better alternatives, which, too, helps others go vegan. The net effect is a positive feedback loop that accelerates the S-curve. I should not let the restaurant off the hook and say, oh, well, I guess I'll have the meatloaf. Flexibility doesn't shift the curve. Steadfastness does. And it works better the more unwavering we are. Let's end with a bold claim. Other than donating effectively... Practicing unabashed, hard-line veganism is the most tractable, impactful good we can do. Our actions help humanity transition from animal agriculture sooner and help rid all the accompanying problems that the destructive industry exacerbates. And if we measure our impact by the curve shift, the benefit is enormous. All the gripes about going vegan are temporary. In the ensuing years, veganism will be normalized and the food options will be better than anything possible via conventional animal agriculture. Inconveniencing ourselves for now helps us get there faster. In fact, the more challenging and foreign our efforts seem, the more good we do because we're at an earlier point on the S-curve. We might have to develop new recipes, coax restaurants, and endure social unease, but it's all worth it. We're agents for shifting the curve to a better world. You just listened to Shifting to a Better World by Kartik Shaker at aftermeatbook.com. And I'm Marian Erickson, your host. And I love this article. I also love the actions that he lists that we can take to accelerate the social cascade. Hosting a vegan dinner party with non-vegans. There are countless dinner party menus and recipes out there. And I found that some non-vegans are truly curious about cooking more plant-based foods. Some prefer to research and find their own recipes, but others might appreciate if you put some recipes together and have people choose what they want to make. And then convincing our workplace to have fully vegan meals is such an important one and an effective one. And you can check out some resources in episode 322 from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine on universal meals, which are meals that are not only animal free, but they're free of the top nine allergens, they're gluten free, they're essentially made to be universally acceptable. 
and those universal meals recipes can also be used for conferences or events if you're trying to convince them to default to vegan options. And defaultveg.com is another great resource to help with that one as well. And pledging to help normalize alternatives and to obsolete animal products is, I think, very important too. One way you can do that is by taking the Liberation Pledge. And I've got a couple of episodes on that, which I'll link in the show notes. Number 314, 311, and 100. And you can find information at liberationpledge.com. But it's essentially where you pledge not to sit at a table when others are eating animal products. And instead, invite them to share a vegan meal or to do other activities. I took the Liberation Pledge for my mental health because I just couldn't be around it. But it's turned out to be a great tool for advocacy as well. So check out those episodes for more information if you're interested. And please share this episode with anyone who might benefit. And thanks for listening.